Hello everybody and good evening and welcome from all around the world. It's great to see new faces and people who, who often come to our public lecture series. So I'm the director of the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research and I'm very excited um, about this presentation uh, because it's um, a little bit different than some of the research and the projects that we have presented so far. Um, in case you're new to the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research, uh, we are within Anglia Ruskin University and we grew from the foundation of Masters in Music Therapy that began in 1994 and more recently the Drama Therapy Masters in 2010 and welcome to Masters students. We also have around 20 PhD students researching across many different um, projects that we have. Um, so welcome to you and welcome to people um, from outside of Pimpshire. We've got quite a, quite a large um, group of people joining us tonight. Um, we have five main areas of research in Simta. One is healthy aging, another is music therapy and brain research. So looking at the neuroscience of music and how that can inform music therapy practice. Then also music therapy and neuro rehabilitation, for example, um, working with people with stroke and also children and families work. And we're about to start a new big project in partnership with Cambridge University um, called Autism Chime, which is a new randomized controlled trial for children uh, living with autism. And then um, our final area is mental health, which really straddles so many different fields. And I think this project tonight fits well within um, that category. So I'm delighted to um, introduce the panel. Um, so first of all, Amelia Clapham, who's music therapist and founder of ACE Music Therapy. And she graduated from Anglia Ruskin in 2015 and subsequently set up a social enterprise, ACE Music Therapy. So it's really good to welcome you here tonight and that we've had a partnership between ARU and ACE in the research that we've undertaken in this project. And then Katie Bolger, Katie Bolger, beg your pardon, welcome to you, who's a music therapist and project manager working at ACE Music Therapy. And she has specialist training and experience in singing and breathing for well-being. And she led several music therapy groups in chronic health, including the Rhythmic Breath program we're going to hear about tonight for long COVID. And Rebecca Westney, um, Wastony, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Welcome to you, Rebecca. Rebecca Wastony, we're really pleased that you're with us um, as a community musician at ACE Music Therapy. Um, Rebecca completed her music degree at the University of Southampton and a PGCE in secondary music education at Goldsmiths University of London. And her work with people with dementia and special educational needs um, is something that she's very engaged with and she's worked alongside music therapists. And Jodie Bloska is Clinical Research Fellow at the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research, so welcome um, you're our home um, uh, member of this, this panel. And Jody studied music cognition and psychology at McMaster's University in Canada before completing her music therapy training also at ARU and is undertaking a PhD with us too at the moment. So welcome to you all. And with I think the panel will talk for about 45 minutes and then we will open up for... Q&A and Naomi will say more about that later in the chat about how to pose your questions. But without further ado, over to you, Amelia. Thank you, Helen, and thank you to Simta for inviting us today to um, join this webinar. So um, first of all, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about ACE Music Therapy. So next slide, please, Katie. 
Thank you. So we are a social enterprise, so we're not for profit, set up in 2017. And our aim is to transform lives through music and also raise the profile of music therapy within the UK. We are now a team of six music therapists and two community musicians um, and also an administration assistant as well. And we're really proud to be um, award winning as an organisation and we work primarily in Essex. So we're based in Chelmsford in Essex, but we also work across London and Norfolk as well. And we work with all ages and abilities, delivering music therapy, both on an individual basis and also on a group basis in a variety of different settings. And we also um, run community music groups and training for professionals, including Makaton training as well. So the Music Therapy for Long COVID project was an idea that came up um, that came up by Katie um, during the pandemic. Um, and basically what Katie thought would be a great idea would be to support people who are living with long COVID, obviously an area that not much was known about. And um, we'd previously done some work with people with chronic health conditions. So we thought that we'd be able to use some of the knowledge from that work to support people um, who had long COVID. So um, we, we put forward a business case to the NHS in our local area, so ESNEF, the East Suffolk um, and North, East, North Essex Foundation Trust. And um, we had several meetings with them and explained what, a, a lot about music therapy and the work that we were keen to do um, in terms of music therapy with long COVID and how we were planning to support people who have long COVID. And then um, going on from that, after we put forward the business case and they'd agreed that they were keen for us to work um, with people with long COVID, we then approached the Colchester and Ipswich Hospitals charity um, to get some money from them to be able to fund the pilot and run an initial 12 week pilot music therapy group, which was in person. Um, so we were successful in gaining that fun funding and then the project run for 12 weeks um, in Earl's Cone Village. And um, we then evaluated the project in collaboration with Simta, um, which Jodie's going to talk a bit more about later. And um, we used the, we the Wellbeing Star to evaluate um, how the sessions went and how the clients found the sessions. And again, Katie's going to talk a bit more about that later. Um, and we were really lucky to then gain further funding directly from the NHS this time to continue the project um, going on forward from a pilot, so continue the group. And then also we gained further funding in addition to that to run a drop-in group for clients who'd been attending who could then drop in and out. So that was an open group. Um, and then we are now in our third year of running this group um, and further funding has been secured for that. Um, and we're also really delighted that we were finalists as well um, for an Advancing Healthcare Award for the British Association um, of Music Therapy Award for music therapists who are developing innovative ways of providing effective music therapy in 2022. So I'm now going to hand over to Katie, who's going to tell you a bit more about the project and the sessions. Hi there, good evening everybody. Um, I do just need to uh, share the screen again because um, I just had to press unmute, apologies. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so this slide um, tells you a bit about our group um, and our objective. Um, and as you can see, um, our main objective here was to provide a supportive space, which was actually face-to-face. Um, and for people who are experiencing symptoms of long COVID, um, by mainly exploring their emotions, uh, by managing their symptoms and connecting to the breath through musical um, exercises. Um, as Amelia pointed out, we had about nine uh, participants who were um, included in this uh, long COVID pilot, but a few more were referred um, but because of the nature of it being face to face and the nature of um, their symptoms, uh, some of them couldn't attend. Um, but we did 12 weeks for the pilot um, and Amelia has obviously told you already that this has continued after that, which is um, brilliant. 
and uh, it's run by um, a music therapist and a community musician. So in conjunction with those two, we are able to provide that as a service face to face, as I say, in a local community, which we chose a village hall that was fairly near to the hospital that they were originally um, referred through. And just moving on to the evaluation. So this was a really important um, part of our group. Um, we had some scientific evidence that we wanted to evaluate. And one of those were um, some medical um, uh, some medical kind of details so um blood pressure and heart rate and also oxygen rate just to see if there are any trends there but the main um evaluation was actually through client feedback and because this was a sort of um mental health group um at heart um we did focus on well-being um and in particular kind of their lifestyle and their ident uh, identity and many of you may have already heard of the Outcome Star, um, which is um, a wellbeing star that we use and we have funding to use through ACE Music Therapy. Um, it's provided by Triangle Consulting Social, uh, Social Enterprise, and it looks at things like um, lifestyle, looking after yourself, managing your symptoms, um, some of the areas around work or volunteering and other activities that you might be um, doing or not doing because of your symptoms at the moment. Um, and it also covers things like where you live and uh, your money situation, maybe relationships with friends and family. So a very, very detailed evaluation. And we track that from the beginning of the pilot to the end of the pilot to see if there's any change in people's um, emotional well-being and physical well-being. And a typical session. So um, this did vary, obviously, and it was very client led. Um, so some weeks were very different to others, but a general um, idea of the session, session and, and one that we would plan uh, would be a check in at the start. So we would get people in a very small circle where people felt comfortable and we would just have a simple check in to say how the week had been for them. And maybe if they wanted to comment on anything that had happened in their week um, and often that sort of generated a, con a conversation about something that might then move into some improvisation. Um, and if not, then we guided them into some kind of structure. So gentle movement exercises to music. We thought this was really important because actually when people sit still and they don't move, there's no icebreaker and often people don't express the way they're feeling. So we had things like ribbons and we sort of threw them uh, into the air and did circles and moved around the room or we might um, sometimes just be stationary on our chair and move our head side to side, for example, just to loosen up really, loosen the body. And then we'd go on to breathing exercises and vocalizations and many people found that this was the main benefit. Um, I think three or four of them had that as their main kind of um, outcome uh, that their breathing had improved through trying these breathing exercises and they were uh, we were trained actually by the physios um, uh, at singing for lung health um, and also we used some vocalizations that uh, were things like vo vocal fricatives so um, many of the kind of vocalizations that you might use as a singing teacher and this helped people to just use their their vocals use their tongue and their soft palate and, uh, and try and loosen things up um, then we might focus on brain fog. So brain fog was a, a very, very uh, big part of um, this group's problems, really, in, in their general life. They found that they'd gone from being a very active person and, and being able to manage things um, in their diaries and, and driving places and then suddenly forgetting how to get to a, a, from A to B. So we focused on brain fog exercises. And, and for example, we might do a drumming game or something, you know, copying the beat or we might do a fun cup game so the cup song um, which uh, maybe many of you have heard of um, uh, you know learning uh, learning how to turn over a cup and making a beat so that was quite fun and generally we play songs we sing and we songwrite we've got a case study about songwriting a bit later in this um, presentation musical improvisation so this was really important because people had preconceptions I, I imagine um, about music therapy and about improvisation and particularly about this kind of pressure of being able to play an instrument um, or, or not being able to play an instrument and using their voice and so when they first came in maybe they wouldn't want to try um, 
to play an instrument and over time over the 12 weeks this became just second nature really and people weren't afraid anymore and uh, so they picked up lots of different instruments um, and and tried those and we would have some really really lovely improvisations um, and and vocalizations as well in that section Generally, we'd finish um, on either a checkout or some kind of relaxation. So we might um, have some sort of, um, you know, calming music that we'd play on the piano or guitar and some vocalizations, or we might just um, sit and, and just, just reflect on what we've done in the session. So how did, how did we help? So obviously we provided, um, we provided this face-to-face -face group, which you can see in the middle there, um, one of our sessions that we ran. And uh, it's providing a tool through the use of voice movement and music, just like music therapy. And, you know, music is the tool to do that. And we equipped individuals with exercises also that they could continue at home. So maybe some of the breathing exercises or singing exercises that they could do at home um, and also their brain fog um, kind of exercises. But most importantly, I think, um, was the supportive group. So you can see that people are in this picture um, kind of communicating to each other. And it was very nice to see that you bring a group together with very similar struggles and you have that support network. Um, I think they even set up a WhatsApp group afterwards. So they continue to support each other through that. Um, with the NHS, um, we were able to meet some extra demand for mental health. And as you uh, may know, even from around the world and uh, health services are, are really, really strapped at the moment. And it's very difficult to get seen quickly. Um, things like having GP appointments or um, on the waiting list for physios and things like that. So through this music therapy group, we were able to provide a holistic support treatment. And that covered things like emotional help. Um, so bereavement, uh, depression, anxiety, for example, and then also the physical side of things, of course. Um, so some of their symptoms, breathing problems, um, aches and pains and things like that. And by this, obviously, facilitating the link between the musical self, the breath and the emotions through musical self-expression and through improvisation. I'm just going to give you a minute actually to read through these. So these are our, uh, just some of our testimonials that we had from the pilot group. So as you can see there, some of the things that I've already um, talked about uh, previously, so breathlessness, brain fog, um, a fun way to get together with other people with similar symptoms to enable them to laugh, um, and also just a way of sharing. And there's uh, one of these uh, quotes, uh, helped me to normalise my daily experiences after months of questioning. And I think that's a key thing that a lot of people question themselves, do I really have long COVID and they came to this group and they finally were um, they were finally kind of rewarded with that um, uh, you know that other people um, are also uh, experiencing the same and um, they're not invisible anymore. So I'm going to hand over to Rebecca now um, who's going to take us through one of our songwriting case studies and uh, talk a bit about how we uh, a typical session um, and in this you'll see um, that there's some uh, some words written by by some of our um, uh, some of the participants and we're also going to play you a, um, an excerpt of that audio so over to you Becky. Good evening everybody um, so songwriting has been a useful tool during our sessions in allowing clients to voice their experiences living with long Covid. We decided to write this particular piece, which we called Lost Myself, as clients had discussed a shared experience of feeling isolated and misunderstood by their loved ones. They hoped a song would support them in being able to share with their family and friends how they were feeling. One of our clients expressed interest in playing the guitar and knew a few chords, and Katie and I therefore chose two simple chords and we just based it around A major and D major and allowed the other clients to choose which instruments they wanted to play around this. 
instruments used were piano, bass guitar, guitar, tongue drum, woodblock, djembe, and the mini harp, and some other different um, percussion instruments. At first, we played the music continuously, so everybody felt that they felt comfortable, and then slowly encouraged clients to shout out how they were feeling as the music played. This was just to um, firstly introduce them to the idea of songwriting um, and to get them feeling comfortable with the idea. And this is how our first words started to form, which then led us to write these words on a whiteboard. Some words clients used during the songwriting process were words such as guilt, pathetic, apologetic, isolated, frustrated, alone, exhausted, and lost. Clients wrote various words down to begin with on their own whiteboards, the ones that had resonated most with them out of the ones that had been discussed. And then they thought of rhyming words and focused on writing four lines to tell their stories. Some clients wrote more than four lines, but that was our starting point. The chorus was composed by the whole group. It grew from a discussion about feelings of losing their identity, something that they could all relate to. And they said they felt lost, but were grateful to still be here and hope that in time they would get back to who they were before having long COVID. After performing the chorus together, we discussed that the style sounded similar to the music composed by the streets. And so we decided to speak the words rhythmically during the verses, whilst adding more melody to the chorus section. Clients seemed to enjoy the rap style that had been created and felt comfortable with this particular genre. Clients were in control of how the structure developed and it naturally took on a verse chorus form with a middle eight and improvisation section. The improvisation section is an example of how the song started to form um, where clients shouted the words out initially and demonstrates how their songwriting journey had begun. And um, we're just going to now listen to just a short section of this song. Thank you. 
hope that you enjoyed um, that clip of our audio there. Um, it's quite emotional to listen to actually um, and reflect on. So um, it's really nice to be able to share that with you all. Um, we're going to move on now to just how we um, link to other specialists. So obviously, um, as I said before, um, we did provide um, an additional holistic approach, um, but that is important as well to be able to provide those people um, additional support and maybe approach uh, those other specialists and health professionals to get some more input. So for example, if someone had a problem with their swallowing or coughing or speech or something like that, we were able, because of the position that we're in, to enable that referral. So by just speaking and emailing to um, SNEFT again, uh, we'd be able to refer them back with, with speed and efficiency that maybe they wouldn't have had before. Um, so we often um, referred them back to speech and language therapy or maybe respiratory physios um, or other specialists and other long COVID clinics, um, including um, GPs as well. And just in case you're wondering, that ball um, game over there was a, a breathing exercise. So we're just lifting. We use these balls quite a bit in music therapy. So we use uh, drumsticks on them to make uh, some drumming patterns. But also we use them for breathing exercises because it obviously forces the, uh, the shoulders to stay down, which is really good. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Jodie now, who's going to talk about the uh, pilot service evaluation. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Katie. So yeah, now that you've heard about the sessions themselves, I'm going to talk a bit about the service evaluation and additional research that we undertook at the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research. So of course, uh, Katie and Rebecca at ACE collected um, outcomes while they were undertaking these sessions. And we've just come in and to evaluate that, that data that they, they collected. And the evaluation was funded by Anglia Ruskin University through the UKRI Higher Education Innovation Funding. And the final report has been published and it's available to read if you are interested in that. So first we evaluated the data collected as part of the pilot program. A total of 18 sessions were delivered across five months to nine participants, as Katie has mentioned. And the participants attended on average seven sessions each and they were delivered in small groups. So on average, four participants attended each session. Within the pilot, Katie and Rebecca collected well-being and physiological data, as they mentioned, and this was to support goal setting and evaluate participant outcomes within the delivery. And these outcomes were approved by the NHS Trust to use and are reported for participants who consented. So we have consent to report the well-being outcomes for three participants and the physiological data for eight participants. And for those eight participants, the ages range from 38 to 58. Um, or sorry, 38 to 56, and six were female and two were male. And next slide, please, Katie. So this slide presents the diagnoses and comorbidities of the participants alongside the referral reasons to the group. So as you can see, all were diagnosed with long COVID and a third also had asthma. And 80% of the participants were experiencing breathlessness and a third were experiencing fatigue. And anxiety, grief, and depression were also reported by one in five participants as referral reasons. And yeah, thank you. And so as Katie mentioned already, the Wellbeing Star is a self-report questionnaire that measures progress across several aspects of well-being when living with a chronic illness. So this outcome was collected with participants before starting the rhythmic rest sessions and then also after completion of the program. And um, as I mentioned, we have these outcomes for three. So these um, are reported here, presented here for three participants and their averages across each um, item. 
And so as you can see, all the items were, sorry, still on Wellbeing Star, sorry. Um, all the items uh, increased after the program, as you can see for these three participants, and the highest increase was seen in managing your sy symptoms, which showed a 71% increase after taking part in the sessions. Looking after yourself, work and volunteering, and money also showed high increases, as well as feeling positive. Um, so you can see that this in indicates that participants progress from finding out about their well-being needs to making changes and getting there in their daily lives. And next slide, please. So blood pressure, heart rate, and oxygen saturation readings were collected pre and post each session. This data uh, was collected again as part of session delivery, and so gave an indication to participants of their current physiologic well, sorry, physiological states, and for the clinicians to see potential impact of the interventions they were using. So therefore, these outcomes were not recorded using a strict research protocol. So the slide reports participants' average pre and post readings across the sessions they attended where data was collected. And you can see in the shaded green area, which shows the normal range for each measure, and the table below the graph shows the statistics from paired samples t-tests that were undertaken on the data. So most participants had an above ideal blood pressure both before and after sessions. However, systolic blood pressure did decrease slightly on average by 2.8% after sessions and diastolic blood pressure remained relatively the same. Heart rate you can see decreased um, and approximately um, on average by 5.8% and although was in a normal range before and after the sessions for all participants. And you can see oxygen saturation was also mostly within the normal range and remained relatively the same. Um, however, for one participant who on average had their pre-oxygen saturation level below normal, um, their post-session oxygen saturation did improve on average by 1.7%. So when, when they came to sessions, their oxygen saturation seemed to improve and reach closer to that normal range. And just looking briefly at the test statistics from the paired samples T's tests, we can see that heart rate was the only measure that showed a statistically significant change from pre to post session and the P value there um, under 0 0.05 and also a large effect size you can see in the Cohen D stat. Um, systolic blood pressure also showed a decrease with a medium effect size, but did not reach statistical significance. And next slide, please. All right, so as Katie mentioned, a lot of the outcomes for the participants were very much based on their, their feedback. And so in addition to looking at the service evaluation outcomes, we collected additional data um, through semi-structured interviews to find out about the participants' experiences living with long COVID and also the benefits and drawbacks of the rhythmic breath sessions. So this slide here just gives a snapshot of those who took part. So there were five participants that came back to have an interview after um, taking part in the pilot sessions. And all of them were still living with ongoing long COVID symptoms. And the time since the onset of their COVID symptoms was between 18 to 30 months post positive COVID test. So the most common reported symptoms for these participants were for fatigue, which all of them were experiencing, but also shortness of breath, memory and concentration issues or brain fog, difficulty sleeping, and also depression and anxiety. So we carried out these five interviews, which lasted between 30 to 60 minutes each, and they were analyzed using reflexive thematic analysis, which involves coding the data and developing themes and um, themes based on patterns within and across participants. We received ethical approval to undertake this research from Anglia Ruskin University's Research Ethics Committee and yeah, and then went and interviewed all the participants. So I will show you the um, results on the next slide, please. So there were four themes that were um, developed through the thematic analysis. And these themes mirror a lot of what Katie and Rebecca have already mentioned earlier when discussing the work. So the first theme acknowledges participants' experiences of living with long COVID symptoms, particularly around how it's impacted aspects of their identity through a change in their usual activities and what they would normally be doing. This has impacted how they feel about themselves, their relationships with family and friends, 
and what they can manage at work. These participants had experienced a lack of available support by other healthcare professionals and a lack of information because of long, because long COVID had so many unknowns at the time. The second theme emphasizes the importance of the group for the members. All the participants spoke about how they felt validated by speaking with others who were also experiencing long COVID. And this was especially because they felt shrugged off by others when they spoke about what they were experiencing. And the participants spoke about how the group gave them the space to share their stories and to talk about their challenges, as this could be difficult to do with friends and family and um, possibly through trying to protect their fam friends and families from the, their struggles as well. So they found the group sessions uplifting um, and through engaging in the music itself, um, and, but also finding a sense of hope through speaking with others who they shared um, similar um, experiences. So the third theme emphasizes how the sessions helped physical symptoms. The participants spoke about how the activities and interventions were relevant for them and how goal setting was done in collaboration between themselves and the group leaders. So it was very patient centered and goal oriented. The sessions helped the patients to learn ways to self-manage their symptoms at home, particularly around learning to breathe properly. The activities sometimes could also highlight aspects of their cognition that they hadn't realized were impaired necessarily. So for example, doing the memory activities through rhythm copying, um, they found they thought they would be able to do that and not able to do that. And this allowed them to sort of figure out um, some reasons for what they were struggling with in their daily lives. And finally, the fourth theme acknowledges what Katie's already mentioned is that participants did have some hesitations um, about joining the sessions in the first place. So um, just to say other than these hesitations, participants did not report any adverse reactions to the set sessions and no one reported worsening symptoms. But before joining, some participants didn't see how it could be helpful for them, particularly due to preconceptions around joining a music or singing group. Participants were sometimes self-conscious about engaging in musical activities and singing in front of others. However, participants felt that they became more comfortable with this through time due to the supportive nature of the group. And next slide, please. So just to summarize, based on the findings from both the service evaluation data and the qualitative interviews, the Rhythmic Breath Program seemed to provide participants with practical, physical, and psychological support when living with long COVID. The sessions seem to contribute to increased well being, particularly through providing emotional support and validation. And participants felt that the interventions were helpful and relevant for their symptoms, um, particularly around breathlessness and memory difficulties. And the physiological data might indicate that the sessions could potentially decrease blood pressure and heart rate. And finally, participants found that the sessions carried into their day-to-day -day lives and that they were able to use these techniques to self-manage their symptoms at home. And next slide. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. So thank you all so much for listening and we will happily answer any questions you may have. Oh, thank you very much. Um, well, you know, such a wealth of information in obviously a relatively new field um, and I just wanted to kick off while people are formulating questions I can see a couple um, you know to ask you all what you would do next if you had funding I know you talked about there's funding of the um, project going forward some funding but if you could say do research into this field and find out more with maybe wider groups. Do you have any thoughts about that or do you want to just consolidate what you've already done? I wonder. So Amelia, do you want to answer that one or do you want me to take that? You're on mute, I think. Yeah, I can answer that. And maybe if you've got anything to add, Katie. Yeah, sure. So I think, yeah, we, we are obviously going ahead and continuing this group um, as a long COVID service. So, I mean, the plan is that this will be an established service, um, but we 
we're still in talks with ESNEFT at the moment. Um, and yeah, there might be scope to do some further research, definitely. Um, again, we're in the early stages of, of talking with them at the moment. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think this has um, proven that, um, you know, that we can um, work in conjunction with the NHS for mental health services. And uh, that does take the pressure off them. Mm. and enables uh, music therapy to get out there as a as a kind of you know field um a bit more and um uh, i think the, the 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 funding i think it's sort of um once a year um and and we do have that committed um but but yeah watch this space because it, it may turn into something bigger with mental health conditions in general and chronic health as well yes yeah, so i was thinking about this unique connection between the mind and body and the physiological mm you know, issue of COVID mm. and then this aspect of mental health and how the reporting back in the first instance has been so positive by the mm. participants. And so whether you would, you know, set up PPI. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting carried away, but if you had embedded um, PPI group sort of designing something big in the future, it's, it's definitely needed, not just for long COVID, but maybe mm. for other long chronic illnesses. So, Naomi, do you want to field questions or do you want me to? Um, I'm happy well. to read out. There's a few questions in the Q and A. Um, so, Despoina, I'm sorry mm -hmm. if I've said that wrong. Asked, was it easy for the participants to participate in the first place? Or did they have some fear of catching COVID because it was in a group setting and it was inside? Um, so I suppose Katie and Rebecca, that's probably a question for you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there was a lot of uh, fear at the beginning, definitely. And people did catch COVID for a second time. Um, some people really struggled with it. Other people didn't have symptoms at all. Um, but we did require um, people to take um, COVID tests before they came, so on the morning of, um, which reassured a lot of people, I think. And we also, um, you could probably see in some of the pictures that we had there, we stuck to the um, required meter rule at the time, whether it was one, one or two or whatever. Um, but generally speaking, we, we went for the biggest space we could. Um, we had very high ceilings, we had good ventilation. And um, yeah, I think, I think that was reassuring for people. Um, uh, it probably would, I would have said it probably put off maybe 5% of those I contacted um, from actually attending a face-to-face. -face. Yeah, and, and just to add to that as well, there was a few things, weren't there, that, um, that prevented people from coming. I think some people didn't want to travel the distance. Yeah. Um, some people, the day just didn't suit. It was a Monday. Um, when we first started this project, we ran it on a Monday morning and then we've now changed it to, to be a bit later in the day um, because we realised that that worked better for, um, for the people to come. Um, but also where the session is, it's in a village hall and some people struggled just to get to the session. And then obviously with the nature of long COVID, um, they found that quite challenging with fatigue and everything, the journey to get there, then to attend a session, then go back home. Um, that was too much but we did in our second lot of funding we did run also an online group um, Katie do you want to say a bit more bit about that yeah so I see someone's asked a question about that as well um, yeah an online group uh, we ran that for the same amount of time I think it was 12 weeks and it was a slightly bigger group um, because I guess people didn't Want, uh, didn't want to attend face to face for whatever reason um, and uh, it, it was good in terms of what we could do for their breathing and for talking about um, their symptoms and sharing and things like that. Uh, we also used some um, art as well like um, sharing whiteboards and things which was quite useful. Uh, so lots of different ideas that we use online um, but it, it was extremely different actually face to face has a real unique edge to it and we really found that people were 
talking uh, much more to each other, much more of a support group. So, you know, like I said, with this WhatsApp group afterwards. Um, and um, yeah, and, and I just felt like those people that turned up face to face did get a lit little bit more out of it, I'd say, than online. Yeah. Thank mm. you. So maybe that does answer, um, well, a comment and question by yeah. Sophie Whisker, and maybe you can enter into more sort of discussion and collaboration after this, which is also the point of the um, these fora. I just wanted to move to the funding question from Hilary Wayner, uh, because it's quite multifaceted, I think. From a research point of view, um, we got some funding from uh, Anglia Ruskin University from within it, from a sort of funding stream that can be applied to, to uh, for projects like this, for starting something up um, that, that may lead to something bigger um, and, and attracting external research funding. So that's one part of it, but the main important part, I imagine, um, uh, Amelia or, or yeah yeah I can answer that so for the pilot for the actual pilot group um we received funding from the Ipswich and Colchester hospitals charity um and we were advised to approach them when we spoke to the NHS they said go to the hospitals charity to get funding so we did um and then following on from that it's been funded by the NHS so they've actually put it into their budget um for us to run these sessions um for the last two years anyone want to add anything there should we oh, move on okay so does there seem to be an optimal number of sessions is another question which you've touched mm. on but maybe you want to expand yeah another really good question there nikki um we we ran 12 sessions because um pilots are usually uh, around about that amount and also i think uh, for, for music therapy it's uh, for groups it's usually an optimal amount but having said that I feel that probably it it you know it, it would have been better to be more um, and some of the participants are still attending now so we've got one uh, client that's um, that was involved in the pilot and he's still coming every week which is great um, and, and we're really only seeing the you know him change um i think in his his demeanor um this year uh, it's, it's taken him a long time he's he was a very bit introverted character it's taken him a long time to warm up so i think it just depends on the the client really um some people take away breathing exercises and they're they're done and they're happy others want to have that ongoing long-term support so yeah uh I, I had another question if there aren't any others, but I'd rather open the floor to others. I can't see any at the moment. Um, I, I suppose as a trainer, um, thinking of the future of music therapy, and I wondered what you've all learned from the project and what you think about how music therapy trainings could um, learn from what you've been doing or whether you think um, there's already in, an embedded um, approach that's similar, or whether this is unique. I, I realise, you know, it's a, it's a relatively small study and one might not show um, a, con a conclusive outcome that, you know, suggested we must train music therapists in a certain way. But I just wondered whether... Um, you as a community musician, um, Rebecca, and also Katie as a music therapist, so whether you had thoughts about that, what training is needed for the future? Um, um, Becky, would you like to go first or should I? Yeah, I think it's, um, for me personally, it's obviously been really beneficial to have this experience. Um, and I found it really beneficial working alongside Katie on this project and having that hands-on experience really um and i've sort of been part of um the supervision side of things as well it's been really beneficial to get that real insight um so i think it would definitely be beneficial as 
you know, as a training opportunity to sort of work side alongside a, another music therapist um, in a project similar to this. Um, yeah, I don't know, Katie, have you mm. had anything else? How you found it as working with a community musician? Yeah, um, I think we've um, we've learned a lot from from each other running the sessions. Um, so that is training in itself. I think you kind of have to be in it and experience it. And it also depends on the client group as well. Um, and I think you know Becky's um, experience as well in teaching um, larger groups and some of the uh, sort of icebreakers that she might have used that we wouldn't have maybe known about so potentially in in the master's training you know having a having some kind of music teacher in would be very useful I think um I also went on a course um that was run by Feeney Cave who I, I highly recommend uh, it's called singing for singing for lung health um I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it um, or heard of her and um uh, that was interesting because that, uh, they actually brought in um, physio, uh, breathing, respiratory physios to train us as, as singing teachers. Uh, it wasn't for music therapists, but there were music therapists on, on those um, courses. But yeah, that, that training was extremely useful. So I highly recommend that to be part of music therapy. And I think I've come from a psychodynamic training at Roehampton, um, which was, um, you know, extremely useful for the uh, the, the very sort of emotional um, and uh, um, mental health side of things, but maybe having further training on 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 the more physical side of uh, well-being would have been very useful. So in chronic health, particularly. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. And the idea of a music therapist working alongside musicians um, mm. who might not have music therapy training has been, um, we've been pioneering a training actually at Anglia Ruskin University. And I just put the link in the chat because we're recruiting right now for this um, CBD course. Uh, recruitment will be closing, I think, towards the end of March. Um, but it is uh, linked to Britain Pierce Foundation and ARU and um, is a place where CPD happens for music therapists in parallel and together with people such like yourself, Rebecca, working um, and, and a really rich exchange of, of skill. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can find out more. I just put the um, link in the chat. And there's another question. We've got time for that from Amanda. Oh, there are two. Amanda Lapping. Um, says so you talk about using singing exercises. Did the physios have input or did they discuss with you their approach? Yeah, so um, we had a respiratory physio as part of the NHS um, team and um, we spoke to them about their approach. They kind of said, yes, that's that's about what we would have done as well. So in terms of just running by our exercises with them. And we also got quite good feedback because um, I think it was a couple of um, clients went to the respiratory physio a few weeks in and they said, oh, it's brilliant because they've just been saying that mu the, the music therapy thing is just doing exactly what the respiratory physios would have done. Um, I mean, obviously, it's it's uh, different in terms of the approach and maybe their uh, method, but um, ultimately the goal is the same. And that is to to just be aware of the breath. And I think that's the most important thing that we try to get across, mm -hmm. to be aware of um, a dysfunctional breathing pattern and to not maybe try to change it quickly, um, but just to work with your own body and to, to uh, you know, be still and, and understand your breathing patterns. Great, thank you. And, and related to that, it's a similar question that Nikki Wilson has asked but it, it's sort of asking a question about would you work in the room in a multi-disciplinary um, way? So would you work with physios, maybe OTs or others? Or do you think this is, what, what, what are your thoughts about that maybe as a final? Comment? Yeah, um, we, I'd love to do that. And I think it'd be very, very helpful because um, particularly having a physio, I think actually coming to a session because then you've got the group and you maybe would be able to, um, I suppose it would go both, both ways, wouldn't it, the sharing of information. Um, 
and um, I mean, it, you see music therapy used for um, things like stroke rehabilitation and, and stuff like that in wards. So I don't see why this could be an integrated program. Um, it just it just would take a little bit more thought and a little bit more um, investigation to do that, I think. Great. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else want to have a final word on the panel? Um, thank you very much. Really a great, great teamwork as well. And it's fantastic um, for us to work with such an innovative clinic, clinical project and a, and a team, you know, where you're innovating in this way. Um, and we'll be really interested to see how it all goes in the future. And so I'm going to thank you and hand back to Naomi, who's going to tell you more about what's going to happen next. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Helen. And thank you for such an interesting um, and innovative talk, as Helen said. Um, just a reminder that after the webinar, you'll be sent a survey. It would be great to hear from everybody with feedback, and that will help us plan next year's uh, Central Lecture Series. Um, and we'd be delighted to have you join us for our next webinar, which is on the 24th of April. And we've, we're delighted to have Professor Carl Christen from University College London, who will be presenting on active interference and generalised synchrony. And you'll be sent more information on this and the link to register from Simpta in the follow-up email and in a few weeks beforehand. We hope to see all of you at our next webinar. And thank you very much for joining. <laughs>